All right, forensic students, today we are talking about time of death, which goes right along with our death investigation unit. Um, so previously we've talked about death as a definition. We've talked about decomposition and the progression that the body goes through um, after death. Today we're talking about time of death and how investigators can determine time since death based on some different characteristics of the body post-mortem. And then we're going to move into forensic entomology uh, in a future lesson. So when forensic investigators discover a victim's body, one important clue to determining the circumstances of the victim's death is determining the time in which they died. So we refer to this time as the time of death, or sometimes you'll see it abbreviated TOD. All right, so today we're going to look at different post-mortem changes uh, that take place, and we're going to talk about how investigators use those changes to determine a probable time of death or time since death. We're specifically going to look at three new terms. So we're going to be talking about rigor mortis, liver mortis, and alger mortis, um, but it's important to bring up that there are other methods of determining time of death, but those are the ones that we're going to focus on today. All right, so just a quick review. Um, we've talked about death as a definition. We've talked about how controversial this definition is. Um, it is the cessation or end of life, but then the question becomes, what does that really mean? So some experts believe that it's the cessation of blood circulation, the heart stops, uh, and some people believe that death occurs when brain activity stops or ceases um, to function. Um, and that's sort of the debate there between the two definitions. Um, even though experts don't agree on a single definition, they all do agree that death is a process. It's not an instant event. And so we've gone through and talked about that process. Um, we've also talked about the difference between manner of death, mechanism of death, and cause of death. So I just want to point out right here that there are four manners of death. So we have natural death, accidental death, you can have suicide and you can have homicide. And then if investigators or medical experts can't determine one of those causes, then undetermined is written on a person's death certificate. So time of death can be determined in several different ways, but it's really important before we get started to understand that time of death depends on many, many different factors. And it can vary under different circumstances and different conditions. Um, and we'll go through all of those and talk about some different variables. Now, investigators are going to seek to determine time of death by using a pathologist estimations of time since death. So we're going to see different terms, and I want to take the time to talk about what these different terms mean. So today in the slides, in the lesson, you're going to see time of death. Sometimes it'll be abbreviated TOD. So when we refer to time of death, we're talking about an exact time. So that is a legal time, the exact time that the victim drew his or her last breath. Um, and that is what investigators want to ultimately determine so that they can use that in their investigation. Now, if we use the term time since death or the abbreviation TSD, we are talking about a time frame. It's not an exact time. It is a time frame between death and the discovery of a body. So if we're talking about it in archaeological context, we're talking about, um, we may refer to it as time since deposition. And then if we're talking about it as a forensic investigator, we might talk about it in terms of post-mortem interval. So you're going to see this term post-mortem interval come up when we get to entomology. Today, you're just going to see it as time since death. So time since death is a time frame. Time of death is an exact time. Today, we're going to discuss a few ways that time since death is determined. Um, but it's important to know that there are other methods as well. So let me see. I've got a slide. Here we go. Um, so these are some other methods that are important to note. Investigators can use um, not only liver mortis, rigor mortis, and alger mortis to determine time of death, but they can also get clues um, from stomach or intestinal contents. They can look at 
the stages of decomposition, which we've talked about in a previous lesson. In a future lesson, we're going to focus on entomology, but even this does not cover all the different ways that investigators can determine time of death. So there's many different ways. I believe this is where we were. Yes. All right. So oftentimes in a forensic investigation, time of death is important because it can provide insight and different clues into a crime being investigated. So post-mortem or after death, the body changes in a fairly predictable manner. And again, we've talked about this when we talked about the stages of decomposition. Now, we went through the different stages of decomposition and how the body changes over weeks um, today, we're going to focus just on that fresh stage. So the body post-mortem, what happens two hours later? What happens four hours later to the body? What happens eight hours later? Um, so today we're focusing on the fresh stage. Now, these different changes in the body are studied and then applied to the field of forensics. So you might ask, how does a forensic expert know about these post-mortem changes? How do they know that... Um, that maggots are going to crawl off from the body at a certain stage of decomposition? Or how do they know the body is going to bloat at a certain stage? Um, and the answer to that is they study this. So forensic anthropologists, investigators, pathologists, medical examiners, uh, scientists in general study decomposition stages. They study different scenarios of a body as it decays, and they look at and study and research other postmortem changes that occur in the body after death. Um, I'm not sure if we have talked about the body farm yet or not, but there is a place called the body farm. It's located in Tennessee. There are some other divisions um, across the United States and even in different countries but these body farms exist for the sole purpose of studying the body post-mortem. Um, they look at post-mortem changes. They look at different scenarios and situations. They look at how the environment impacts decomposition. And then they relay, relay that information to anthropologists, investigators, pathologists, medical examiners, so that they are up to date on the most current uh, research that exists for how the body changes after death. All right, so again, these are some different things that we're going to talk about over the course of the next few lessons. Today, we're focusing on um, the three mortises, so liver mortis, rigor mortis, and algor mortis. All right, so let's start with liver mortis. Um, the liver mortis is, the term liver means uh, color, and then mortis, of course, means death. So when we're talking about liver mortis, we're talking about the color that the body turns after death. So more recent deaths are often accompanied by what we call blood pooling. You can see that in the picture. So remember from the last lesson that when a person dies, their blood stops circulating. And this lack of circulation is going to result in the blood pooling in areas where gravity is going to pull downward on the blood. So blood pooling is especially common if a body is found in an unusual position, um, but it can also be used just um, investigators can look at the color that the body turns after death to determine the position of the body at death. So um, as the body begins to decompose, blood seeps down through the tissues and settles in the lower parts of the body, and it causes the body to turn a purplish color, almost like a bruise. And we'll look at some pictures in some um, future slides. Um, so where that blood settles, you're going to get this dark purple color, deep purple color, um, and we call this lividity. So when you hear an investigator talk about lividity, they're talking about the, the pooling of the blood after death and the color that it turns. All right, so write this down because this is important to know. Lividity begins approximately two hours after death and is permanent after eight hours. Okay, so it starts two hours after death, permanent after eight hours. This is a progression. So it starts with a lighter color purple, and it gets darker and darker and darker as it moves to that eight-hour period. Now, this is not a be-all time frame. There are so many different conditions 
and environmental factors that play into this um, and variables that play into this. So the information that I'm giving you, I want you to think of it as in a perfect world. So in a perfect world, in room temperature, normal conditions, um, lividity is going to start at two hours and be permanent after eight hours. So lividity can help determine time of death, but it can also help determine um, if the body has been moved after death. So it can help determine the position of the body within the first eight hours of death. So I want to give you an example of a case study um, where this was important. So the lady you see in the picture, her name is Susan Cape, or was Susan Cape, and she was found in a park in New York City. Um, she was found lying face down. However, liver mortis was present on the dorsal or backside of this particular victim. So what does that tell investigators? Well, that means that the lady was lying on her back for approximately 8 to 12 hours post-mortem. So investigators knew she had to be moved after the eight-hour period. Okay, so she was murdered. Um, her, she was left in the park. Uh, she was lying on her back at the time. So that's why the lividity is present on her back. And then at some point, someone moved her because she was found lying face down and there was no lividity on the, the front side of the um, body. So that tells investigators she was moved. Maybe there was a primary crime scene or maybe she was moved um, from some another part of the park and there was evidence left there. Um, I'm not sure the details of the case, but it did give investigators another lead or another clue into her death. All right, so um, we're going to the term ambient is going to come up a good bit in this lesson and some future lessons. So the ambient temperature at which a person dies does impact the time it takes for lividity to set in. So that is a variable that has to be considered by investigators. So what is ambient temperature? Ambient temperature is the temperature of the crime scene and its surrounding areas. So when we talked about crime scene investigation, I did mention to you that it is important for investigators when they're working the crime scene to make note of the ambient temperature. Okay, and that is the environmental temperature because it, it does prove to be important when determining time of death. Now, some things that I want you to keep in mind, warmer temperatures are going to increase the rate of lividity. Cooler temperatures are going to decrease the rate of lividity. So we're going to look at some different scenarios and situations um, in some practice activities that we have. And it's important to know that if we have a situation where temperatures are above room temperature, so we're assuming room temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we have temperatures that are higher than that, then lividity is going to happen quicker than if we are working in temperatures less than room temperature, less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at some different scenarios so that you can see what lividity looks like in real life. So you can see it's very similar to bruising. Um, because this is the blood pooling after death. Uh, I also want to point out here, because you can see it really well in this picture, areas of the body that are in contact with solid surfaces are going to be absent of lividity. And this is due to the compression of blood vessels and the inability for blood to pool in those areas. So investigators call these pressure points. And you can kind of see the white areas here um, are going to be pressure points. Now, what happened in this situation is this lady um, died on a park bench. She was lying on her back, um, and she was on her back for at least eight hours before her body was found. And so you can see the lividity here, and you can see the pattern of the park bench um, on her back. Right, so you can see the lividity here, the blood pooling at the, um, the back. And so this man was lying face down, um, sorry, not face down, lying on his back when he died. So you can see that purplish bruise color. You can see lividity here. 
um, said this lady was lying face down um, when her body was found. Um, she actually did die face down. You can see the pressure points there, so the absence of lividity. Um, in this case, those white spotches on her knees and um, toe region and then the top of her foot there, um, you can see that that just shows the pressure point where blood was not able to pull. So those are some real life examples of lividity and what it looks like. So let's look at a situation. It says, uh, Sydney Green's husband made a 911 call to operators at 1 p.m. asking them to send an ambulance to his home. Forensic investigators reported dark lividity. Uh, so remember, lividity does progress, goes from light to dark, from the two hour to the eight hour period on the victim's back and the temperature of the home was normal. So seven, right at 70 degrees. Um, so we're not looking at anything, any huge variables here. Everything's pretty well normal conditions. Now, the husband states that his wife was fine an hour prior to when he left the house. He said he left the house to run an errand, and when he returned, she was dead. So um, investigators were able to determine that he was lying because she had that dark lividity, which means she had to have been dead for close to eight hours. Um when investigators arrived. So his story is not matching what the investigators noticed with regards to lividity. All right, let's move on to rigor mortis. So you may have, you may have seen um, rigor mortis um, in maybe an animal. I know I, I see animals in the summertime on the side of the road um, about 10 hours to 12 hours after they're hit by a car. Um, they show some bloat, but they, they also show some rigor. So we're going to go through and talk about rigor mortis. Just a reminder, after people die, their muscles will contract. So when oxygen is no longer present, the body is going to continue to produce ATP via a process called anaerobic glycolysis. So when the body depletes itself of glycogen, the ATP concentration diminishes and the body enters a state of what we call rigor mortis. So rigor means stiffness, mortis means death. So this is the stiffening of the muscles after death. Now, rigor is temporary. Um, so it can be useful in determining time of death, but since it's temporary, you, you have a time frame that you have to work in. So just like with lividity, rigor mortis starts about two hours after death. Um, and it's a gradual stiffening of the muscles in the smaller muscles to the larger muscles. So typically the stiffness starts in the head and neck muscles and gradually works its way down to the legs or to the larger muscles. After 12 hours, the body is usually in perfect conditions at its most rigid state. And this is going to last for another four, six, eight, 12 hours, and then it's going to gradually disappear. So I have a chart for you, and it might actually be helpful to pause the video and record this information um, because you're going to want to use this when we start on some practice activities. You're going to want this information. So pause the video, get this down, and then come back and we'll talk through this. All right, so um, postmortem, within the first two hours, there's not going to be any signs of rigor. Um, now, rigor will begin to develop at two hours in the head and neck, and then it will move to the larger muscles down through the body um, until the entire body is rigid. Um, so when the entire body is rigid, then the body has been um, deceased for approximately 12 hours. Again, this is in perfect conditions. Now, at 13 to 24 hours, uh, rigor is going to gradually disappear the same way it came on. So I always think head, shoulders, knees, and toes, because um, the song comes to my mind. That's not entirely accurate, because it does work from smaller muscles to larger muscles, but your larger mus muscles do tend to be in the lower regions. So if um, investigators find a body with rigor in the legs, but not in the head or neck, they can um, approximate time of death being 
or time since death being 24 to 26 hours prior. Um, and then we know that the stiffness generally dis disappears over the course of 24 hours, but that is a range. It can be 24 to 36 hours. So investigators know this. They know the different variables that they have to take into consideration when they use these time frames and time intervals. Um, and you too will also have to take this into consideration when you're trying to figure out time of death or time since death. All right, since the stiffness gradually starts to disappear after 24 hours, if a body is found that shows no visible sign of rigor, then we have two options. The body has most likely been dead less than two hours, or the body has been dead more than 36 hours. Now, if the body has been dead more than 36 hours, there are going to be other methods for determining time of death. So again, rigor mortis is not the best method, but it could be used to provide some clues as to time since death. Now, there are a lot of different factors and variables that investigators have to take into consideration when they're trying to figure out time since death using rigor mortis. So a couple of things that they have to take into consideration is ambient temperature. Um, so the environmental temperatures, just like with lividity, cold temperatures are going to slow rigor down. Uh, heat will speed the process up. So keep that in mind. Um, age or illness is also a factor. So people with low muscle mass, such as children or elderly, are going to develop rigor more quickly. Uh, if a bodybuilder dies then, um, and they're fairly healthy, lots of muscle mass, then rigor is going to happen more slowly. Fat, um, I want to point this out, fat acts as insulation. So if a person has a lot of extra fat, then it's going to cause rigor to develop a lot more slowly than a person who is leaner. Um, also, uh, body temperature and physical exertion just prior to death, that is a factor. Um, so if the body temperature increases, then the rate of rigor mortis is also going to increase. Uh, so for example, if a person is struggling to fight off an attacker prior to their death, then the body temperature will be higher uh, and rigor mortis is going to develop much faster. All right, so we're going to go through um, some different scenarios uh, in an uh, exercise that we're going to do or activity that we're going to do. So I'm going to skip over this just a second. And we're going to jump straight to algor mortis. All right, so the last um, topic we're going to talk about today with regards to time of death is algor mortis. Um, so because rigor mortis leaves a lot of room for doubt, Forensic pathologists rely on other indicators that provide for greater certainty as to time of death. And one of those indicators is body temperature. Uh, so we call this algor mortis, which is the cooling of the body after death or heat loss after death due to the body's inability to maintain homeostasis. So we know when a person's alive, they're able to maintain a constant body temperature. And then in death, the body is no longer going to generate that heat and it will lose that heat to the environment. So this will happen, that heat loss will happen until the body reaches ambient temperature, until there's an equilibrium reached. Uh, so when investigators take the temperature of a corpse or a medical examiner takes the temperature of a corpse, um, it is taken rectally or via the liver. Um, and it's important to note that normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees. So uh, when we're talking about some of these situations, we're going to assume normal body temperature unless otherwise stated. All right, so algor mortis is the most accurate method of estimating time since death, but it does require intensive knowledge um, to be used accurately. Uh, so, investigators have to really factor in all the different variables that exist in a situation or an environment and account for those different variables when they're trying to determine um, how body temperature plays into time since death. 
So here are some general rules. In warmer environments, heat is lost more slowly. In cooler environments, heat loss happens more rapidly. So that's important to investigators. If they have a body that's found in Colorado uh, in the mountains in January, the body is going to lose heat much more rapidly than if they find a body in South Florida in August. Um, so environmental temperatures, ambient temperatures are super important variables to consider when trying to determine time of death using body temperature. All right, in ambient temperatures that are higher than the body's temperature, heat will actually be gained by the body. So remember from physical science or physics, heat always moves from the warmer object to the cooler object. Um, and so if, you, if the body is the cooler object and the environmental temperature is the warmer object, then the body will actually take on that heat. Okay, so you have, have to keep that in mind too. All right, so this is something that you might want to write down in your notes. A rule of thumb states that there is a decrease of approximately 1.4 degrees per hour um, after the first initial hour. So within the first initial hour, the body's not going to change temperature very much. Um, and then after that first initial hour, the body's going to lose about 1.4 degrees per hour. Um, and that's going to happen up to uh, 12 hours. And then we'll talk about what happens after the 12 hour mark in a little bit. Let's look at this example, though, to see if we can determine um, body temperature uh, in a situation. So we have a person who dies at 3.15 p.m. If I want to know their approximately, approximately what their body temperature is at 5.15, um, then I've got to do a little bit of math. So we have, we're going to assume the body temperature is 98.6 degrees, normal body temperature. Um, and you will assume this for all of these calculations that you're given unless otherwise stated. So we're going to assume body temperature is 98.6 degrees. Uh, the time of death is 315. So remember, within the first hour, the body is not going to lose any heat. So at 415, the body's still going to maintain that temperature of 98.6 degrees. Then after that first initial hour, the body's going to lose about 1.4 degrees. Uh, and so the ending temperature at 515 when the body's found should be approximately 97.2 degrees. That's if, that is if all conditions are perfect. All right, so something else you need to add to your notes. After that first 12 hours, the body is not going to lose as much heat. So at hour 13, the body will start to only lose about um, 0.7 degrees per hour until the body reaches ambient temperature. So let's look at this situation. A woman dies at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. She's found that same day um, at 11 p.m. So if we want to know the approximate body temperature, um, we can draw it out or we can um, just do some quick math calculations or we can use a chart, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit. All right, so we're going to assume that the lady dies with a body temperature of 98.6 degrees. Uh, remember, within the first hour, it's going to maintain that temperature. Within the second hour, um, the body is going to decrease temperature by 1.4 degrees every hour. Okay, so we're going to do the math there. Then 12 hours later, the body is going to start to only lose 0.7 degrees every hour rather than the 1.4. So I'm going to subtract from there. Uh, and then if I keep going to 11 p.m. when the body's found, then I'll have an ending temperature of 81.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So let me give you a little shortcut that will make your life easier as you calculate. So eventually you're going to have to calculate time of death or liver temperature based on certain, certain scenarios. And if you take the time to create a chart that looks like this, it will make those calculations so much easier. So um, if you'll just make four columns uh, and several rows, I don't know, this may be 30 rows maybe, 
so this is post-mortem. This is the body temperature at that time, how much the heat the body's going to lose, and then the new temperature. Okay, so at death, we're going to assume in perfect conditions, body temperature is 98.6 degrees. This is an instantaneous um, temperature. So no drop in temperature, 98.6 degrees. Okay, within the first hour, the body temperature is going to be 98.6 degrees. Within that first hour, there is no drop in temperature. And so the new temperature will be 98.6 degrees. Okay, now within the second hour, we're at 98.6 degrees. So 98.6 would go here. This time, we're going to lose 1.4 degrees. So I'm going to subtract 1.4 degrees from 98.6 degrees to get my new temperature. Okay, and then in hour three, you're going to take that new temperature, plug it in here, subtract 1.4 degrees to get the new temperature. You're going to keep working down. Remember, though, at hour 12, you're going to lose 1.4 degrees, but at hour 13, you're not going to lose as much heat. So at hour 13, then you will start um, subtracting 0.7 degrees rather than 1.4. Now, sounds complicated. If you have to rewind those instructions and play it back, do that, but complete this chart. Because when we start doing those worksheets and practice problems where you have different scenarios, and we say a body was found with a rectal temperature of 84.5 degrees, then all you have to do here is come find 84.5 degrees and then see what the approximate time of death was. Uh, and so take the time to do this. You will thank me later and I will see you in the next video.